Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix. I'm Karen Quinn. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm your song leader today. <laughs> so we're happy, very happy to have Reverend Sky Williams Tao in our pulp today. Um, Reverend Sky grew up in our congregation and she was ordained here, so we're particularly happy to have her here, to have them here, sorry. Got speaking of pronouns. Um, they will be sharing their insights on covenant with us. Um, and we're also very lucky to have Nicole Pesci back on the piano today. <laughs> and our opening hymns today is um, in the Teal Hymn Mill. It's 1007. There's a river flowing in my soul, but the words will be up on the screens. And we'll sing it together. So please rise in body or spirit. Good morning. Good morning. Please, please be seated. <laughs> I'm John Palumbo. My pronouns are he, him, and I am privileged to be your worship associate today. Right. Now, join me as we recite our covenant and Isabel Davy Grant lights our chalice. If you're watching remotely and have a chalice with you, Please light it as well. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Love. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to share in fellowship, thus do we come. Now please be seated. As uh, Reverend Christine would say, we're humaning together. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix. No matter where you come from, how you worship, or how you identify, 
you are welcome here. Welcome home and welcome to worship. Welcome as we explore the mysteries of being human together in community. We are so glad that you are here. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix strives to be a spiritual community for our time, one that is theologically diverse, radically inclusive, and justice-centered. If you are new here, we are so glad you found us. If you're willing, you can raise your hand if you're new. Welcome. Each Sunday is different here, so please come back a few times to really get to know us. If you're willing and able, oh, I already did that, sorry. <laughs> we have a few announcements for our community. Spring is here, and next Sunday, March 17th, is our treasured flower communion service. Please bring flowers to exchange with the congregation for this beautiful tradition. Did you know that SRP generates less than 4% of its power from solar? If you own your property and pay SRP for water, power, or irrigation, you may be able to vote in the, their April 2nd election. Come to the back table for a ballot application. Next Sunday, March 17th, there will be a presentation after the service by SRP Clean Energy and AZ Interfaith Power and Light, C Compass and RSVP. I am also very, very excited to share that this Saturday, March 16th, at 2 p.m., we will be ordaining our very own Brigitte Vieira. We will be ordaining her right here at UUCP. We are asking congregates to please RSVP, and we are also asking attendees to sign up to bring something for our potluck immediately following the celebration. The information is in Compass, and Vicki Myers is there at the back table, and will be able uh, back table at the back sanctuary, and will be able to help you out with anything you need. Please come celebrate this major milestone with us and our beloved Brigitte. Now on to stewardship. The seeds have been planted in rich soil and have been watered with care. I am excited to share that as of this morning, we have received pledges totaling $121,284. So we are off to a great start for our goal of $615,000, but we need your continued support to ensure those seeds grow and we bear, and bear a bountiful harvest. To make your pledge today, you can log on to phoenixuu.org, scroll right down, like literally scroll down an inch and there's a big blue button that says make your pledge. It couldn't be any easier. Um, so go ahead and get on phoenixuu.org, hit that pledge button, or you can see me at the back of the sanctuary after service to grab a pledge form. Because we understand that your financial situation may have changed in the past year, we do not roll over pledges from the previous year. You must renew your pledge to be counted. The seeds we plant today bear the fruit of tomorrow as a symbol of our garden's growth. Um, as a symbol of our garden's growth, we have this wonderful piece of art where when you make your pledge, you can add your thumbprint to our garden. And so we have a wonderful tree over here, a little tree over here, and Johnny's mysterious thumbprint right in the middle. So how, whatever is your garden, please add your thumbprint to it. Again, I'll have that at the back table as well. All right. 
and to share with you how the seeds of children's ministry past have grown into the fruit of today, I'd like to invite Jeff Anderla and Isabel Davy Grant to come up with, come up and share with you their words. Hi, I'm Jeff Anderla and if Hillary Clinton taught me anything, it's to wear red when you're talking in front of people. Hi, my name is Isabel Davy Grant. Um, so what was it like growing up in UCP? Well, it was really wonderful growing up here, if you don't know. Um, I will start this like I did 40 years ago and say I've been coming here since before I was born. Uh, and it truly was wonderful. I uh, was able to gain a lot of friends going through children's ministry and uh, also see many people come through here and um, continue lifelong relationships. What was it like, what is it like growing up here at UUCP? It's very amazing, that's one word to put it. And um, you meet a lot of new people that have different uh, beliefs and backgrounds and a lot of different perspectives on how you, on the world and it's very um, welcoming. What was your favorite thing about children's ministry while you were growing up? Well, I think one of my favorite things was uh, the lifelong relationships that I started here. Um, I still speak with somebody who I met here when I was four, just a short 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also learning different viewpoints and being trusted to take what I wanted, uh, and leave the rest. What is your favorite thing about children's ministry? Well, one of my favorite things about children's ministry is seeing Robert every day. <laughs> um, and one of my other favorite things is meeting new people. Uh, what do you wish children's ministry had that didn't have? Uh, well, most of all, Robert. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was, it had just about everything that I wanted. Um, I mean, more kids would have been great. Uh, when I was in high school youth group, there was about six of us. Um, and I think that with a, bar, a broader group, it would have been better, but it truly was amazing. <laughs> and what do you wish children's ministry has that they currently do not have? Um, probably more children as well, because I feel like having more perspectives on the world is always better, and having more children going through the, uh, the program is probably one of the best things that could happen. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. So now we have our opening words, which are from a piece called What They, be Dream what they Dreamed Be Ours to Do, Lessons from the History of Covenant by Reverend Rebecca Parker. The piece goes, my life was given to me. I did not make myself, and this is how it is. We receive who we are before we choose who we will become. As human beings, our lives begin and never leave the soil of this earth that shapes us through blood, kinship, genes, culture, associations, social systems, networks of relationships, and extended communities. 
Even when we do not directly know the people whose lives are linked with ours, our lives unfold in relationship to theirs. And this is how it is with covenant as well. We are born into relationship before we shape relationships by our conscious intention. We inherit covenant before we create covenant. End quote. And so now I invite anybody who would like to to come forward for together time. Welcome everyone. So for the Together Time today, um, I went looking for things that talked about change. And one of the things I found is Rev something Reverend Jamie Dingus put together when she was thinking about how our principles are changing. So how some of the fundamental things of Unitarian Universalism are changing. And as she was thinking about how things change, but also how they stay the same, she thought about how technology had changed in her lifetime. So she, thought, so she thought about how some of the technology had changed, but the things that people did with technology stayed the same. So for that, I wanted to look at how technology changed in my lifetime. And uh, I went and asked my dad for help <laughs> and asked him about how things had changed in his lifetime. So the first thing I have to show you is a vinyl record. And so this, when my dad was growing up, this is how people used to record and play music. Um, and this one in particular was my favorite one he showed me because this is, um, my dad was in a high school band. Um, my dad is in the audience, but my dad was in a high school band. Um, and this is how they used to record uh, record things. So nowadays, if you see somebody who's doing something cool, um, you might pull out your phone, or somebody might see you doing something cool and pull out your phone to record. But back when my dad was young, this was the way to record it. So let me see if it can. Oh. So. That's what the vinyl record looks like. <laughs> and then I brought one in that's really more do you have a question? I brought one in that's really more for the adults. Um, this is from the Beatles, so Sgt. Pepper. Um, I figured some people might remember that. And I brought some vinyls in if anybody wanted to pass them around. So my dad's a generation above me, and then when I was thinking about how people used to play music when I was a kid, um, I was thinking about CDs. So I brought in for you all This is a CD, it's a mix CD that uh, one of my exes made for me um, to put together songs that he thought I would like. And I'll also tell you this, so then I wanted to put together a CD for my then partner, now husband, because I was like, that's such a cute idea. And by the time I put together a CD for him, he didn't have anything that could play a CD. <laughs> But I also brought, oh, and I also, so I showed you the Beatles vinyl. So this is um, CDs by Tracy Chapman, who's an artist I really like. So if you want to see CDs. And then as I got a little older, technology continued to change. So the next thing that came out are these guys, 
which are our little iPods. Um, and this is closer to what a phone, I think, nowadays looks like, where you could store and record music on it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> just <laughs> watching people. Um, oh, and this is, so this is how you would play a CD, a little CD player. The point of this being that things change, right? There's all these different ways and different technology. There's big disks, little disks, big square things. Um, but the fundamental things that were done with all of these were the same. People use them to record their loved ones, to share those recordings with others. People use them to share famous and beautiful songs that they wanted to share with each other. So in the same way that even though the technology changes, but the fundamental things remain the same, in our religion, we might change our principles, um, the wording might change, but the underlying values and the underlying things we're trying to do remain the same. And that's the same with the covenant, which is the change that I'll be talking about today. Oh, that's what I have for you all. Each week, we split our offering between this congregation and an organization that shares our values. For March of 2024, our Share the Plate partner is Homeless ID Project. This organization, in operation since 1988, helps people who are unhoused or recently released from incarceration to replace their IDs. An ID is necessary to apply for a job and permanent housing, to enroll children in school, to receive non-emergency medical care, and to receive many services provided to the unhoused. It is the first step in helping people end homelessness. On an average day in 2023, Homeless ID Project program staff saw 90 clients providing 60 documents, replacement IDs, and birth certificates primarily, and safely stored vital documents for 25 individuals. In 2023, the Homeless ID Project assisted 22,846 clients, release, resulting in the successful replacement of 15,622 documents. Homeless ID is based in Maricopa in Pima counties, for all that you give, we are so grateful. Ushers, thank you for your willing hands in helping us pass the plate.
it is an important practice in this community to make time to share pieces of our lives with one another. Sharing them together, we can amplify the joys and lessen our burdens. If you're on Zoom and you'd like to share a joy or sorrow, please type it into the chat. Type into chat a brief note of what it is in your heart today. I will read out loud what you share. If you're in the sanctuary, there are cards located on a small table in the back of the sanctuary, so please be sure to share your joys and sorrows next time you visit. As we open this sacred time to share in community, let us open our hearts to the joys and sorrows that we share together. And, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm humaning again. <laughs> Just seeing what's coming in online. Um, while waiting online, one joy here in the sanctuary today, um, kind of uh, accidental synergy, um, but Isabel, who lit our chalice and shared what it's like being in children's ministry today, officially becomes a teenager this week. Happy 13th birthday, Isabel. Um, this one, kind of a, a repeat announcement, but I'll share. Chris Seashore and Liz Merchant, we are so excited, joyful, thri and thrilled that UUCP will be able to ordain Brigitte Vieira next Saturday here at 2 o'clock. Please RSVP through Compass. <laughs> Now, as we open this sacred time to share in community, let us open our hearts to the joys and sorrows that we, share, that we shared together and those still in our hearts with a moment of silence. And actually, one just came in online. Good timing. <laughs> um, Bill Snowden and Joan Gale uh, share they had an amazing dinner with company at the Tucker's Garden Party. So thank you to the Tuckers for opening their home to our community. And uh, Sorrow, Reverend Christine wanted to make sure that friends of Jean Sherry, who used to be a friend of the congregation passed away on Friday. He was very fond of this congregation and died of kidney failure and other complications from diabetes. And a joy, Walt uh, Weider, Weider, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say the name, um, on Wednesday turned 80 years old. So happy birthday, Walt. Okay, now let's take a moment of silence. For all the joys and sorrows, those named and those in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, we send our love to each other, both here and online. When we are holding so much in our world and in our hearts, it is good to take some time to connect with our body and our spirit. 
Oftentimes, this can be the only time we get to stop and do this in our busy weeks. Let us soften into the here and now in a spirit of meditation and prayer. So relaxing, settling into this present moment. To start this meditation, I'll tell you that I remember hearing Steve Almond from the podcast Dear Sugars talk about how rereading something is a form of prayer. That the act of coming back again and again to something precious to us can be a form of spiritual practice, especially when there can be cultural and technological pressure to digest things quickly and keep moving on. So this morning, I offer you this prayer. I am going to repeat a question four times with some juicy silence in between. The question is one that the youth group of this congregation gave to small groups to talk about during their service on February 28th. So now I give it to you all again to be with, to spend some time with, to let it soften and connect you to yourself and to all that is holy. Here is the question for the first time. How do you bring joy and beauty to the community? How do you bring joy and beauty to the community? How do you bring joy and beauty to the community? How do you bring joy and beauty to the community? Amen and blessed be. So for our second hymn, we're going to sing an oldie as Tranquil Streams. It's number 145 in your Singing the Living Tradition hymnal, or the words will also be on the screen. So please rise in body and spirit as you are able and willing.
Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Yeah, me too. I said the same thing. Listen to them. They know when we're supposed to sit and stand. I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to be worship associate for this service because I have very, very strong connections to our covenant. Partly because I was raised Catholic and crave ritual, but mostly because it doesn't say that about 85% of the world is wrong. It isn't exclusionary, but inclusive. In our covenant, we find words such as love, truth, service, peace, freedom, fellowship, all things that I crave. And I don't just hear those words said each week, but I also see them demonstrated from all the amazing works, workers and volunteers of our children's ministry who model our covenant in their actions, from the choir and musicians that can make you dance one minute and cry the next, from our volunteers that organize so much community outreach and political action, from the unbelievably generous pledge, pledges that ensure we can make all of this happen, and from the simple acts of love and compassion given without thought every minute of every day. Every week, I witness our covenant in action, and for that, I am grateful. Thank you. Thank you. 
you. So let me start by showing you all this. Holding it there a second for the camera and just for a description of what this is. So this is a printed copy of the covenant that's said every morning in this congregation. Um, and it's framed, it's got a nice sort of blue backing. Um, and again, so printed on it is, love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to share our strength and fellowship, thus to be covenant. It also has the old UUA logo on it, which I just think is a fun little touch. So this covenant was given to me when I worked at the congregation as a ministerial administrative assistant in 2016. Um, and so how, what it was is that I was working um, back by the minister's office and there's this storage room by the minister's office where they had a bunch of things and they were getting rid of things. So somebody asked me if I would like this guy and I said that I would. And the reason I said yes is because the covenant always meant a lot to me. I was realizing it's one of the few things I came out of this congregation knowing by heart. So I didn't actually know the seven principles. I'm working on the new principles. But I did know this covenant by heart from reciting it so many times. So when I was offered a framed copy, I said yes. The other thing that's really cool about this particular copy is that there is a handwritten note on the back of it. So that handwritten note reads, Ellie and Bob Murphy, continuing love and appreciation for a job well done. March 15th, 1991, Rod and Audrey Engelin. Yeah. So it was really meaningful to me, especially as I was reflecting on it for this sermon. Um, so I'll start with the date, which is 1991, which is before I was born. So quite literally, this is a physical copy of like this manifestation, this web of care and connections that sustains this congregation. Um, the story I have made up about this note, I can't verify that this is true, I have just made it up for myself, is that um, Ellie and Bob did something wonderful for the congregation, so Rod and Audrey gave them this as a gift. And then one of the things that you all probably can't tell is that the last names on those names are written in a different pen at a different handwriting. So continuing on the story I've made up in my head, whenever this covenant went from Ellie and Bob's possession to back to the congregation, my story is that somebody then wrote the last names on because they didn't know if people would recognize them. So again, it's just this very beautiful way in which these folks who I don't personally know help to shape the congregation that then went on to shape me as I was raised and grew up here. Very much felt the words um, from the opening reading uh, from Reverend Rebecca Parker about how we inherit covenant before we create covenant. So I'll come back to this, but I'm gonna take a detour into the history of the actual written covenant. So this is also from 2016. Uh, so Emma Staten, who I saw was here this morning, um, was the ministerial intern at the congregation at the time. And he uh, wrote a sermon that was about the history of the words of this covenant. In that, he writes, in 1933, in the midst of the depression and midway between two great wars, a book was published by a Boston press 
by one L. Griswold Williams, containing a compilation of 101 responsive readings, a resource to be used for material and church worship services. And tucked away in the back, after the 101 readings and before the acknowledgments and index, was a single page titled, A Covenant. Reverend Williams' covenant is the basis of the words we used at the beginning of our service 83 years later. So, as I was writing this sermon, I also realized that I made a mistake <laughs> in the description of this service. Because in the description of this service, I said that it was Reverend James Blake, not Reverend Williams, who had written the covenant. And that was because I, um, I took this history from Emerson's sermon and I actually lost the sermon. Bef like, I read it when I was in seminary and then I lost it and that's when I wrote the description and then I found it again as like this little miracle <laughs> as I was writing this sermon. Um, and as I was looking for the history online, that's what one of the UUA, the National UU website said, was that it was Reverend James Blake. And that's because the two covenants are very similar. So Reverend James Blake was a Unitarian minister who wrote a similar covenant in 1894. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but his starts, love is the spirit of this church. Reverend James Blake. Reverend L. Griswold Williams was a Universalist minister. So this is before merger. The two denominations are two separate things, although clearly there's some overlap or, you know, going back and forth. Uh, Reverend Blake, Reverend Williams was a Universalist minister who wrote 30, 40 years later in 1933 this. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve mankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus to be covenant with each other and with God. So just hearing that, reading that, I think you can hear the, both the resonance, the ways it sort of directly is this lineage, and also the ways where clearly some changes have been made. So I said I read Emerson's sermon for the first time a while ago. It was when I was in seminary, and I went looking for the history of this covenant because it was this really important thing to me as I was exploring my sense of Unitarian Universalism. I wanted to know what the history was. And I remember when I read his sermon for the first time, it felt like it shifted something for me. Because before that, I felt like the covenant was this thing that was really high above me. It was like untouchable. It was just a thing that had come out of thin air that I could never grasp or hold. It was just, it just existed. But reading the history helped me ground it in a person, in a relationship, in a time. And that this was a uh, like real thing, again, with this, its own story and history. And that fundamentally, it actually was just this thing that one person had written about 100 years ago. And all of that is really the answer to the question of why I ever thought I could rewrite the covenant. So I kind of talked about what was printed on here before. And then later on, a couple months ago, I went and actually wrote, literally rewrote something on top. Um, so that rewrite is, we return to love again and again and again. We value what is true. We honor holiness. We try and we fail and we grow and we rest and we try. We are here together now. We need each other. We covenant. So
So that rewrite, the context for it, was that I was reading through a report called Widening the Circle of Concern, which is a report from 2020 that was put out by the Commission on Institutional Change, which was a national UU committee um, that was looking at incidents of racism that had happened in Unitarian Universalism. Uh, and it was really like that committee was formed directly in response to some things that had happened. So the sense of this being like a real thing, I think was sort of, like it wasn't theoretical, that's all I'm saying. So when I was thinking about that rewrite, I really had in mind the ideal of fallibility or the idea that we are not always acting in alignment with the values that we hope to be in alignment with. Um, the other context is that I remember I like, originally when I wrote the sermon, I like had out all of the pieces of what I had coming from it, but I wrote the covenant very quickly. What I remember is that I was sort of in the time of going to bed, and then I had been thinking about this report and the friend that I was reading it with, and then I just kind of had the idea, rolled out of bed, went into a notebook, and wrote it down. And I've tinkered with it a little bit, but really that fundamental thing came out right as I was writing it. Um, and as I think about it, while I wrote it quickly, I felt like it was really feeding out of this web of relationships, experiences, things that I had read. So as I was processing all of this, I called that web of things uh, the soup. <laughs> the soup of experiences, the soup of articles and books and people I had talked to and lived experiences I had had that this all kind of emerged from. And I wrote that, so again, I found Emerson's sermon a little after I had wrote some of the sermon. So I had thought about the soup as the metaphor before. And then I read Emerson's sermon, and he actually has a line that talks, speaks to that, which I thought was really rewarding. And it also made me laugh because his is much more elegant <laughs> than my soup. Here's his sentence. These words were not necessarily a unique creation of Reverend Williams, but instead showed an evolution of religious language that was used by Unitarian and Universalist communities. So in my head, I was thinking about like, you know, Reverend Blake, Reverend Williams, and then my brain would also just go, the soup. <laughs> um, and that made me laugh so many times writing the sermon <laughs> and practicing it. Um, so I mentioned that I wrote, literally wrote what I read to you earlier on the covenant. And I also put a couple of stickers on. Um, because one of the things I realized as I was writing this, reflecting on it, is that this wouldn't really feel like mine unless it was colorful and fun. So there's a little bee that has the colors of the trans flag, and there's a little pink dragon blowing some flame. So then, at this point in the sermon, I was going to go through my rewrite line by line, and I ended up not doing that for time reasons. And you can thank me or not, depending on your mileage. <laughs> But I am going to talk about a couple of things that I changed from my rewrite as a, as a result of writing this sermon. So the first one is that initially I ended this rewrite with the words, we covenant. And I ended up crossing that out and rewriting it in purple pen to say, we return to love again and again and again. Because for me, um, I felt like return, literally returning to love in the context of the piece felt right. And also because that line for me is really always an invitation to return to love. Like when I say people are sometimes outside of their values, I am including myself <laughs> in that people. So it's a line for me that invites me back in and invites me back in again and again and again. And the other thing, but I wanted to keep the We Covenant, right? I crossed it out, rewrote something new, but I wanted to keep the We Covenant, so I moved it up to the title. And again, a thing I realized as a result of the sermon is what that shifts, is that the piece goes from our covenant to We Covenant. 
And quite literally, like linguistically, what's happening there is that it goes from a noun, our covenant, this thing, to a verb, we covenant. This is a thing that we do. And that felt right to me. So I have been told to end sermons that I should have a call to action, which has never really been my strong suit. But, and sometimes I was, sometimes I just don't do things if I don't think they're necessary, but, <laughs> but I did feel like this sermon had a call to action sort of bubbling up in it. And so that call to action is this, that sometimes I think we can hold things that we think are sacred or holy, we can hold them so tightly that there's no space there's no space for play and color and laughter and life and living. And the parts of living that are about making mistakes and crossing things out and rewriting them. So my call to action for all of you is to write on things. It's to put stickers on things, especially the things that you find most holy or most sacred. Thank you so much for that, Sky. I needed to be reminded to be much more active in the covenant as well, and so thank you. Um, so our final hymn is an African-American spiritual, Come and Go With Me. So if you want to rise in body or spirit, the words will be on the screen. As we close this service, our service, we remind you to reach out to someone new or that you haven't seen for a while. Our exploration hour activities for children and adults start at noon um, and will be listed on the screen following the service. For our closing words. My dream 
for Unitarian Universalism is that it changes, that it continues to change and blossom into something that is more beautiful, more loving than I can even imagine right now. And the way that I know how to make that dream into reality is to plant some seeds, to write on some things, to create pieces of Unitarian Universalism that both honor the covenant that I was given and that transforms that legacy into what is needed for who we are now. I invite you into that dream and into that process of creation. Go in peace, go in love. <laughs>